Senator Rhiannon. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Telecommunications Interception and Access Amendment Data Retention Bill should not be passed. Uh, my colleagues, Green Senators Scott Ludlam, Christine Milne and Penny Wright, have set out a very clear case why this bill should not pass. It is a disgrace the way, the, the way in which the Liberal, National and Labor parties have colluded to rush through this parliament, this bill that creates the government's mass surveillance regime. It is a result of an ugly backroom deal between these parties. By the government's own admission, mandatory data retention alters the balance between government and individuals when it comes to their right to privacy. The best the um, Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition have come up with to justify their anti-democratic deal on the internet and smartphone surveillance laws is to say, just trust us. They want us to trust a government which has broken election promise after election promise. They want us to trust a government which has shouted down any attempt to hold it to account and which has publicly savaged statutory bodies and human rights watchdogs for simply doing their job. We have to ask, why does Labor want us to trust this Liberal national government? Our colleagues in the House of Rep Representatives were contemptuously given just 30 minutes to debate 74 amendments, denying the public and parliament a chance to scrutinise this backroom deal between uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott and opposition leader Bill Shorten. The bill now before this chamber should hold the government to account but no, it effectively waves through mass surveillance of Australian citizens. And we know that because we've heard from the opposition and the government saying, it's, it'll be right, just trust us. There are a number of questions that remain unanswered as the government tries to ram these changes through. There has been a lot of, a lot, there has been a lot of hyperventilating and hyperbole from the Prime Minister, who has all but claimed that law enforcement will halt without warrantless access to metadata and mass surveillance of our citizens. Now, that is clearly ridiculous. It is just a new form of the law and order campaign that we've seen wheeled out by conservative governments, particularly at a state level, but increasingly at a federal level with national security and now using metadata in a similar way. It is clear that the amendments agreed to uh, by the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader do not implement the recommendations of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security or address the concerns that have been raised. Labor rolled over. Why? We still haven't got to the bottom of. On an issue as serious as giving security agencies additional rights and powers over people's smartphones, internet records, the Labor, and Liberal and National Parties as I said before, are, just, are saying, just trust us. But that raises a number of key questions. Where will the data be stored and will it be subject to foreign laws? How does the government define a journalist and a journalist source? Will it be deleted after the mandatory period? And if so, how? Will the data be secure from, from cyber attacks? But the answer we get is just trust us. We have only seen how this sort of meta we um, have already seen how this sort of metadata can be abused. The existing Telecommunications Interception and Access Act allows law enforcement authorities in Australia to access some categories of metadata from certain ISPs and, and telcos. In fact, however, a laundry list of other organisations have gained access to metadata for undisclosed purposes, including Centrelink, the West Australian Department of Fisheries, Racing Queensland, the New South Wales Hair, Health Care Complaints Commission, the Victorian Taxi Directorate, various local councils, the RSPCA, and the Office of Environment and Heritage. And I'll come on to the issue to do with the ABCC shortly. It is open season on metadata already, already under the current law. There's the, already the ability to do so much of what the government says that it needs to achieve. 340,000 warrantless accesses took place in the 2012-13 financial year, and that's before a mandatory data retention regime is in place. Uh, and, and my colleague, Senator Scott Ludlam, set this whole issue out very clearly about the amount of warrants that are out there. 
Now, the evidence about metadata requests under the current regime shows that a massive number have nothing to do with solving serious crime, but instead relate to petty requests by agencies, including the Australian Taxation Office, Centrelink, to track what ordinary Australians um, not suspected of any serious crime are doing, again hi highlighting the dangerous territory the Labor, our Liberal and National parties are taking us into. Now, the Attorney General has pointed out that this bill does not change the existing arrangements, and that is precisely the problem. It welds on two years' worth of additional data which can be indiscriminately accessed by agencies. This is despite, the fact, despite that fact that evidence shows that most law enforcement metadata requests are for short-term data, meaning within three months rather than two years. And now, under the new legislation, the Attorney General will also be able to add to the list of agencies with access to our data. Senator Ludlam called this scope creep, and that is what you see all over this legislation. <laughs> Very relevant to the debate is to note that the now defunct Australian Building and Construction Commissioner received a total of 77 authorisations for data through the TIA between 2007 and 2012. The Fair Work Building and Construction Agency, which replaced the ABCC following a successful union campaign, received one authorisation in the 2012-13 financial year. Now, we know the Abbott government is trying to reinstate the ABCC. It's um, one of the issues um, right at the top of its agenda. It's also flagged in November 2014 that it is also considering another agency with similar powers to ASIC dedicated to monitoring unions. Both of these organisations, like the ABC before ABCC before them, may be able to access metadata of union officials and union members. Now, this is a very frightening aspect of the bill, and again, what Labor have signed off on, considering they say they are so deeply against the ABCC, is very troubling. We need to look at these bills together and what this government is up to. As I said, it's a frightening aspect of this bill that the government will supercharge it its anti-union attack legislation with these anti-democratic measures that we are debating tonight. And again, that has to be emphasised so strongly that Labor are hand in hand with this government um, bringing forward legislation that is becoming, as we look into it more and more, it's like a twin of the ABCC legislation. The Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance has voiced concerns on behalf of its members on the chilling effect that the abbott shorten deal will have on journalism in this country. While the Labor Party has claimed it wants to protect journalists and their sources, their deal with the government fails to deliver on this. As the MEAA has said, the requirement to get a warrant to access data on journalists still ignores their key ethical obligation to not allow their confidential sources to be revealed. While journalists worldwide have faced jail in upholding this obligation, mandatory data retention means it is no longer their decision. Journalists in Australia can no longer guarantee their sources and whistleblowers that they will be protected. Journalists understandably are concerned that this law is anti-investigative journalism and anti-whistleblower. Now, I do think we need to take a pause here. We need to consider what this means for investigative journalism and a free and open media in this country. I mean, so often we hear people in this place espousing the importance of a free media, but this, this bill puts that at threat. Again, this is a key consideration that should be at the top of this debate. We don't need to wait until we see whistleblowers hauled hoil before courts for exposing dishonesty, fraud, waste or corruption to know this bill is wrong. We'll see it. Um, investigations, won't, investigations won't go ahead. Whistleblowers will hesitate. Courageous public servants will wonder if they should speak out. Real reporters will decide that they don't want to put the others at risk, people who they depend on for their stories. That's how we expect this to play out. The public interest advocate to be set up to oversee metadata searches on journalist data is no solution. For example, there are no rules requiring the Attorney General to seek the views of the PIA or for the PIA to argue against warrants being issued for journalist metadata. 
In addition, it is an offence involving two years' jail for anyone to disclose that a warrant for metadata has been requested or applied. And this is compounded by the fact that in today's environment we see a fragmentation of journalism and the greater need of protection for acts of journalism. Acts by the likes of Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. In fact, the protections, such as they are, may not apply to many of the new players in the media landscape, such as bloggers. This prompts the question, who is really being protected by mandatory data retention? In the rush to pass data retention, the government has failed to demonstrate how it will achieve even its own stated goals. The Attorney-General's department could provide no evidence from anywhere in the world that mandatory data retention improves community safety or helps reduce crime. There you have it. No proof that it improves our safety or will reduce crime. I mean, why is this being done? That's why you've got to go back to look at the organisations that will access this. The government still hasn't defined the metadata it wants industry to store, and they want to be able to change the definition on a whim. Law enforcement agencies have consistently claimed the extra powers are needed without providing concrete examples why it is needed. For example, why is it that we need to retain data for two years, where the evidence shows, as I said earlier, that most law enforcement metadata requests are for much shorter term data, usually within three months? Evasion of the scheme is easy for anyone with, willing, will, with ill intent. Virtual private networks are easy to set up and use, while something as simple as using a Gmail account can put one outside of the scheme jurisdiction. However, while those who may wish harm can easily bypass the scheme, all Australians will, will be subject to surveillance. It is wrong to assume that only those engaged in criminal activity will be affected by this surveillance. The recent New South Wales parliamentary inquiry into police surveillance of other police officers underlines how irresponsible this legislation is. We can't rely on police to determine issues to do with the surveillance of the public with no external oversight. The New South Wales inquiry has revealed extensive abuses in how surveillance warrants, warrants have been issued and abuses by police using their resources to spy on other police and journalists. The inquiry found that TV reporter Steve Barrett was targeted by crime agencies with dozens of improperly obtained covert surveillance warrants between 1999 and 2000. The inquiry uncovered a series of warrants being rubber-stamped by the Supreme Court. In one case, there was zero supporting evidence for 46 of the 114 targets on a single covert surveillance warrant. A former judge admitted there, that there is no way to properly check that the warrants were in order. He resorted to checking for ob obvious areas like inclusion of the names M. Mouse or D. Duck before he signed off. That's serious. That's what he said. Despite the warrants coming in in inundating waves, he also couldn't remember refusing a single one. I, I set that out in detail because this is from an inquiry about police surveillance, where they couldn't get it right, where there was no accountability, where there was no, no standards, no external involvement, and it shows what we're walking into. Now, those abuses by police officers have been revealed, but did the Attorney General take any notice, learn any lessons? Clearly, that hasn't occurred. The Attorney General is ready to give police and security forces unprecedented access to endless quantities of data to intensify surveillance in such an extreme way. Then there is the still unresolved issue of who will actually pay for this surveillance. As Senator Ludlam set this out very clearly, um, detailing that important letter um, that came just last week from a number of the um, telecommunication companies. Um, and setting out how much this is going to cost. Uh, and again, I think that is a very relevant part of the debate because the, the Australian government will not say who will be paying this surveillance tax. But what we do know is that it will be the public who will end up paying either with higher data charges or through higher taxes. The New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties are one of many groups that have provided in-depth analysis on the dangers of this bill. They have stated in some of their material 
It is not acceptable for ASIO, the AFP, police forces and other agencies to be able to access the extensive metadata of citizens on their own internal authorisation. The bill allows them to do justice, albeit within some parameters. Legal experts and organisations, civil liberties, privacy and human rights groups, among others, argue the need for a warrant system, a long-standing safeguard within our legal system. The intelligence and security agencies argued, successfully it seems, seems that any form of warrant system would impose too great a logistical and bureaucratic operational constraint. It would seem the self-serve system is to continue and long-standing safeguards to be sacrificed. This is a mistake and will lead to misuse, abuse and overuse of this data. The post hoc safeguards proposed will not be adequate to pr protect against these outcomes. And I do urge senators to look up in full the um, material from the New South Wales Council of Civil Liberties on this issue. Now, Big Brother has become Big George in this, in this situation, and Big George works hard to keep a straight face as he sprouts his justification for these extreme laws, saying those who have nothing to uh, hide have Senator nothing Rhiannon, to fear. Please resume your seat. Senator uh, uh, Sullivan, point of order. If, uh, if the good senator uh, is referring, uh, Big George refers to Senator uh, Brandis, then uh, she should withdraw the remarks. Uh, and uh, call the senator by his correct title and apologise if she feels uh, so inclined. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Rhiannon, I just uh, invite you, if you have been uh, referring to the Attorney General, to re uh, refer to him by his correct title. Um, thank you for the advice, uh, um, Acting Deputy President. Mm. Uh, with regard to um, the, the issue of collecting metadata, um, it is very concerning what the Attorney General is doing to his own office. Um, the standing of the, the Attorney General is something that is very important to the whole nation in terms of the um, upholding justice. Um, and we've already seen the abuses of metadata. Let's remember that um, when the Australian intelligence agencies were interested in <coughs> metadata of leading um, figures in Indonesia, um, it was the metadata from the Australian president's phone, uh, from the Indonesian president's phone, and the Indone former Indonesian president's wife's phone. Um, that that was an issue of metadata. Again, showing how these services have been abusing the use of that data. Now, ever since um, the terrorist attack of September 2001, crime, spy and security agencies have been demanding more and more powers to reach into our private and digital lives. This incursion for mandatory metadata retention will not make us safer or more secure. Mandatory data retention strikes at the very heart of the relationship between governments and the public. This bill, set to be passed on the combined vote of the Liberal, National and Labor parties, is an enormous setback, as it delivers, on, uh, delivers an increase in the power of the state over private individuals for indiscriminate surveillance. The campaign to stop the level of surveillance, this level of surveillance to have this bill repealed is set to become, I believe, one of the most important issues in Australia. Thank you, Acting Deputy President.